Hello and welcome back to the smoke room. We're going to begin Cliff's route. While a fox's wager is tempting, it's just that. A wager. I can't go risking everything when I've already lost so much. The weasel seems an easier mark. Though, I could do without the longing stares. You. It was Cliff, right? He stands at attention, fur bristling. Y yes Clifford Tibbetts. It's your lucky night. He lingers there for a moment, slack-jawed. Murdoch raises a brow at me, a smirk tugging as it, his muzzle after he eyes Cliff up and down. That's what I thought. He pats Cliff's shoulder, startling the weasel out of his trance. Do try not to wear him out, Sam. This one looks excitable. I beg your pardon? Cliff's getting more flustered by the minute. Murdoch, however, just shrugs, smirk turning into a smug grin. Perhaps I picked the wrong person. What's that supposed to mean? Oh, it's nothing. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got work to do. Enjoy. He saunters off with a wink. Cliff casts his eyes to the floor, clutching his satchel tightly in front of him. Come on. Follow me. The stoat enters before me, making himself at home before I can even close and lock the door. He walks spryly around the room, floorboards creaking underfoot, only stopping when he passes the mirror to fix the tufts of fur on his head. His clothes still have the faint trace of dirt and blood on them, though I have to admit he smells a lot fresher than most of my clients. I'll take mint over sweat any day. Quite a lovely room you've got here, Samuel. It's very atmospheric. I can't tell if he's being genuine or talking down to me. It's not the worst place to spend an evening, I suppose. The mines have it be by a hair or two. Especially in such good company. He smiles at me, then sets his satchel down on the bed, running a pink paw over the sheets. I follow him there, hoping stray smells don't linger. How you feeling? Most men aren't exactly ready for action after taking a beating like you did. Furrowing his brow, the stoat sits next to his satchel, hands clasped together on his lap. I'm quite alright, thank you. Just a tad... rattled, I suppose. Can you believe people are allowed to conduct themselves in such a manner? I sigh. I can, but I also can't do nothing about it. Surely the sheriff could. Assaulting a stranger in broad daylight? Criminals like that shouldn't be allowed to walk the streets, much less enjoy a drink at the local establishment. If you're lucky, they'll get slapped with a fine and be back home before sundown. Better than the alternative, having them sit in jail for days and getting mad as all hell when they're let loose. I put a hand on his shoulder, taking a seat next to him. He turns to look at me, eyes magnified several times by his glasses. Things are already so vastly different from what I expected. Echoes full of surprises. I hear my voice crack in the middle of the sentence as my mind wanders back to Jack for the briefest of moments. I hope he doesn't notice. As an academic, I'm not sure whether to be intrigued or frightened by the prospect. I feel the wrinkles in my forming grimace. I'm not particularly looking forward to the prospect of having to peel him off the street again. Just be careful. The people here, they don't like people like you and me. People like us? Queers. Just keep your head down. You can do that, right? The weasel rolls his eyes. Well, of course, Samuel. I did not come all the way from Batavia to get snuffed out by some common criminals. Batavia? Have you heard of it? Not anything beyond what Cynthia's told me. I shake my head. It's a small nation in Western Europa, not too far from the Isles. I hail from its capital, Shippensburg. Sh what? What's it like? Flat. He laughs. Actually, I could show you if you'd like. There's that overly familiar tone again. You've got pictures or something? 
In a sense. He reaches for his satchel again, taking out a stack of what looks like postcards. The one on top is distressed and worn, its edges frayed. It shows a street with colorful buildings lining a blue canal. Walking the sidewalk are many different species, half of which I've never seen in my life. That's Shippensburg, as painted by Antony van Howelnik, 1864. One of my absolute favorites when it comes to his work, to be honest, though I'm rather biased. He offers me the card. I handle it as delicately as I can. But even then, it's just about falling apart in my paws. My father took me to see the actual painting once in City Hall. Does your family still live there? I hand him the card. My father and sister share our ancestral home, though I haven't seen them since I left for the university. They still send me the occasional letter. As for my mother, she passed away about ten years ago. I'm sorry to hear it. Not really, of course. I don't know any of these people, and I barely know the weasel himself. Don't be, Samuel. It was a long time ago. What about you? Do you have... I don't have family. I'm grimacing again. Cliff's eyes whiten, and he lets out the smallest of gasps. He looks away to the floor, or to the walls, as if trying to find the nearest exit. Oh, that that that's... He falls silent for the first time since I've met him. Is that all I had to say to shut him up for a second or two? His pink paws return to his little satchel, fingers gliding over the buttons, opening and closing it repeatedly. I squeeze the shoulders to snap him back to reality, but he ends up dropping the little bag and spilling most of its contents, mostly papers, on the floor. The little guy scrambles to pick them up. I am deeply sorry. I didn't mean to upset you. Don't you worry about a thing. His attempts to get the papers only ends up scattering them around the room. He closes his eyes and lets out the longest sigh, rubbing the bridges of his snout. Need some help? He looks at me, the insides of its ears redder than ever. He nods shakily. I was right. He is cute when he's quiet. I slide down on my knees next to him and grab everything I can get my hands on. There are postcards and pictures, along with some papers that have long-sounding words on them I don't quite understand. They're all written in neat cursive that reminds me of Cynthia. What's all this about? Cliffs looks at the papers in my paws while he stuffs the postcards back into his satchel. Those are the notes for my thesis. Hand me those, if you please. Thesis? What's a... Oh no! They're all scrambled! He's gathering what looks like a book's worth of documents, evening them out and stuffing them back into his satchel. He doesn't get up, instead clasping his paws in his lap once more. All right, that should be all of them. Please forgive me, Samuel. I didn't mean to waste our precious time together behaving so... well, clumsily. Now... He wrings his paws, shutting his eyes tightly. May I... T touch you? Ain't that why you're here? I suppose it is, yes. All right, here goes. He reaches out, gently placing a paw on my thigh, rubbing in a circular pattern, squeezing intermittently. His nose twitches. You smell amazing tonight. What kind of fragrance are you wearing? Just me. He strikes me as the inexperienced type, so I put my paw on his, guiding it to my side. It seems to take him by surprise, and he finally opens his eyes again. He trembles against me, a shaky breath escaping his muzzle. There's more of that mint. Is kissing allowed? I nod, and before I can even brace myself, he leans forward, placing his muzzle against mine. I reciprocate. And even though my tongue easily dwarfs his, he doesn't let that stop him, deepening the kiss. I can smell his arousal in the air, the musk starting to show through the scent of his perfume. It's strong, and a bit different, but it's not really bad. Hmm. When he breaks the kiss, he's left panting, paws struggling to find the buttons of my shirt. Once he gets it off, his paws roam my torso, kneading my muscles, exploring every inch. My goodness, you are built like a house. 
I don't need to look down to be able to see that he's hard as can be. I do feel him pressing up against my leg, grinding me. Ha! P pardon my enthusiasm. I've been waiting for this all evening. I'm about to reach for the lump in his pants when he takes a hold of my wrist. Letting himself fall on his back, I fall with him. He's pinned underneath me now, eyes half fluid, breathing ragged. I unbutton his vest and shirt while he wrestles with his bow tie, hot breath washing over my neck. He worms his way out of his shirt once the buttons are dealt with, letting it fall to the floor underneath. For a bookworm, he's got quite the render's build. His fur is a nice brown, but splits at the cream color of his jaw, which runs all the way down. I run my paws through the fur of his chest, eliciting a gasp from him. Soft to the touch, clean and as fragrant as the rest of them. But what happened this afternoon is plain to see. There are scratches and bruises all over him. Fuck, they really did a number on you. I brush a finger over one of the bruises. He clenches his teeth with a grunt. It's a price I'm willing to pay for just this. Would you mind helping me with my trousers? Hmm? My pants. He's wrinkling his legs underneath me, shooting me a sheepish grin. He's already leaking as soon as I undo the buttons of his pants and tug them down, dick straining against the soft fabric of his underwear. It's practically springing to life when I take them off. When I run a finger over it, he lets out the tiniest squeak. Very sensitive. W well I inhale deeply, then exhale a bit, letting my cheeks fill with the warm air. Then I puff on him, amused by how easy it is to make his length twitch. W what are you doing to me? I smirk, staring up at him. Anything I want right now. He opens his mouth to reply, but I've already parted my lips to take his thin, long length in. As I scoop the side of his cock with my tongue, I can taste that his skin is smooth and fresh. It's nice to give head to somebody who takes care of their body. I savor the warmth, salty pre that sticks between the top of my mouth and my tongue, then swallow it slowly. The weasel is trembling. I didn't know you could use your tongue like that. Well, when you think about what feels nice for your own, it's easy to come up with things. Cliff looks as if a sudden thought just hits him. I suppose that would make sense. I cock an eyebrow. What would make sense? Why, the others I've had weren't very good. I snort. No, I don't suppose they would be. Easier to know what feels good when you have one yourself. I rise to my knees and hold my balls, hefting them up to let the weasel see my growing tip. Want to find out how natural it is for guys to give head? The inside of the little weasel's ear tips look like the color of cherry tomatoes and I can't help but give him my toothiest grin. No amount of perfume he puts on would hide the kind of smell he's giving off right now. All he can do is stare at it, moving his snout with his gaze as I bounce it, getting it big for him. He sits up and crawls towards me on his arms, whiskers trembling. He thinks he's as close as he can get without it touching his face, but I'm not done growing. Oh. The warmth of his cheeks feels nice against my tip. See, you already almost finished with the difficult part. The stoat gulps. What's the hard part? Getting used to the new taste. He looks away from me, back down to the reason he's here. I watch him stare, almost indecisively, while I can feel my heart beating in my groin. Tell me what to do first. Just give it a lick. But keep your eyes open. That's the most important part. His muzzle parts and I see the shy trace of that tiny pink tongue. Important to know who you are and what you are as you taste it. Lean in and start at the base of my cock, close to my balls. Then drag it all the way up to my tip, near the hole. Easy to say, but to do, well. The weasel nods at me, determined, then takes the plunge. His little tongue warms and wets me as I feel him shake, letting out an involuntary squeak before pulling away. 
That's so bitter. I tisk. It'll get sweeter with every lick. Promise. The weasel looks down again, unsure, trembling nose, sniffling curiously before giving another lick. Better. But only because it tastes like my mouth spray. I chuckle. It won't taste like mint for long, especially since you're a quick learner. The weasel licks me again, eyes half lilied. This doesn't seem so difficult. Then let's try something harder. Harder? The weasel's mouth is still open when I push the back of his head down on me, filling as much of his short, broad muzzle with my dick as I can without making him gag. Cliff's tail is thrashing wildly, the black tip bottle brushing as he looks side to side. He stops moving erratically when I make a shushing noise and pet his head. That's a good boy. The weasel tries to muffle something, but it's garbled by my own gentle bucks into his mouth. You're just picking this up so fast. His eyelids droop as I feel his mouth vibrate when he moans on me. I feel my first burst of slick pre-release into his mouth. You taste that? The weasel tries to talk, then nods the best he can considering his position. Very good. The best thing you can do is swallow it all, but if you swish it around your mouth, you'll find that slipping on and off me is so much easier. I can feel and hear him swish. Start bobbing. He's sliding on and off me now, and his sucks are getting loud and slurpy. You have two free hands. Use one on my balls. Grab the base of my cock with the other. His small pink paws feel plush and delicate against me when he cups them. I can't resist pushing off me and holding his chin, prying his open mouth to admire my sticky handiwork. You're very talented, Professor. Cliff pulls away indignantly, swallowing and cleaning his mouth off with my wrist. Student! I feel the spurt curling up my face. So you are, in many ways. The weasel shoots me an inquisitive look. You know, I really appreciate what you're doing for me. Who said you were done? I gesture to my tick, which is throbbing and dribbling. The weasel holds up his paw. But as I am paying you, is it not traditional for the patron who decides what we get to do? I sigh. Well, I suppose you've got me there. Hell, I was enjoying that. Well, perhaps you could turn around? I do. Enjoy my back that much? I roll my shoulder blades for him, feeling my muscles stretch and my joints lightly pop. Suddenly, I feel something cold and wet on my taint. It's his nose. Whoa! He starts to lap at me there before trailing up over my rear. He prods and pokes and lashes at me with his tongue, but doesn't push into me. I stand there rigidly as he licks me. It feels... really good. So good that my tail thrashes, swatting him in the face. Shit. I twirl on him, feeling my eyes go wide, hoping that I didn't hit him too hard. Concern wells up in my chest, but the weasel starts chirping with laughter. Now I'm the one starting to feel heat blossom in my ears. That was uh, a little sloppy mistake. I'm sorry. That's fine. I should have warned you about what I was going to do at the very least. But it felt way more effective as a surprise. No kidding. I just wanted to see if what worked on women worked well on men, too. Granted, with women there's different techniques involved and different parts, of course. You don't get swatted by tails so easily. You are but just a single sample, but the immediate results were reassuring. I loom over him, pressing close, and lift him under the shoulders. Wait, what are you doing? You're getting cheeky. Let's finish this. I drag him to the bed with me, lying him supine on the sheets below me, holding his wrists. My head bows down as I lock muzzles with him, tasting myself on his tongue as I try to swallow it, and he frantically explores me. 
I pull from his mouth and then move on to his left nipple, lapping it there as he struggles, both of our cocks pressed together, both of them drooling between our abs. Then I turn my body entirely, scooting down Cliff's body and positioning my legs on top of him so that my balls are dangling over his nose and my dick is pointed at his mouth. He's shorter than me, but his torso is longer than mine, proportionally, which allows us to comfortably suck one another at the same time. His squeaks are louder than my grunts, but both of us are there at the point where we can't control ourselves anymore. I feel the pressure building up in my balls and my hips are moving without the permission of my brain. I try to warn him, but my mouth is full. We're whining together as we feel one another twitch violently. Thick jets of his salty spunk are bursting into my mouth. This sets me off and I mumble as spray after spray of my cum empties into his greedy little mouth. Some of his seed escapes the inside of my cheek and dribble down the side of my chin due to the power of it. I brush it off and turn around to give him an apologetic grin when I freeze. The little weasel's entire face is splattered and cum. Seems like he couldn't swallow it all. He looks back at me and I look back at him. We both let out the most rancorous laughter. He falls back against me, still sticky and smelling like sex, and curls up against my arm. It's suddenly very hard to keep my eyes open. My eyes shoot open. Moonlight leaking through the gap between the curtains is the only reminder that there's even a world beyond this room. A strange scent fills my nostrils. It's not mine. It's not Cliff's. It's something else entirely. Something rotten. I try to turn my head to see if I can find what's causing it. I try to, because I can't fucking move. It's like I've been nailed down to the bed. I can't even wiggle my toes. The smell's getting stronger, enough to make my eyes water. My stomach lurches with a strange mixture of fear and nausea. I want to call for Cliff, but I can't make a sound no matter how hard I try. Fuck. Cliff's head is buried in my arm. I can feel his chest heave as he sleeps silently. There's a heavy breathing sound coming from the inside of my room. Not from me. Not from Cliff. From the corner of my eye, on the other end of the room, I can make out the faintest shape of something. Something big. Is it a man? Its features are hazy, but I can make out what looks like a coat of gray fur. A pair of glowing red eyes is peering straight at me. When I blink, it's still there. The scent is becoming unbearable. I want to vomit. I want to do anything. But I can only watch as it begins to move towards my bed. Its steps are loud and heavy. Its strides unnaturally large. It moves far too quick for something that big. I squeeze my eyes shut tight. Samuel! My eyes snap open to see Clifford hunched over me, one brow raised. He's still naked, holding a rag that's dripping with water his other paw cupping my cheek. My breathing's still ragged, and it's only when I try clearing my throat that I notice I've been screaming. I notice a pail of water sitting next to the bed, and I reach for it without even thinking. Tipped my muzzle away from the stoat, I cough once, twice, and then everything comes out at once. By the time I've hacked up the last of yesterday's meal, the soapy water turns dark and murky. The pail nearly falls out of my hands when I set it down on the floor. When I meet the weasel's eyes again, his mouth's hanging open, I almost expect him to get ready to leave right then and there. Instead, he sits down next to me, pushing the pail aside with the foot paw. He clasps his hands. Are... are you alright? I rub my eyes, shaking my head. Bad dream. Was it even a dream? It felt so real. Would you like to talk about it? I exhale a lot of breath. Not really. I'm surprised you haven't walked away yet. My voice is so hoarse, I'm practically croaking. He tugs my sheets down, starting to leisurely scrub up my chest and torso with the rag. I grit my teeth. It's cold. It wouldn't be very gentlemanly of me to leave you behind after a night like that. Now, would it? 
especially with you tossing and turning in your sleep the way you did. He gestures for me to sit up. I do, raising my arm so that he can scrub my armpits and my back. I'd complain, but I'm in no mood to do much of anything. I... Cliff stares at me, nodding urgently. I think I saw a creature in the room with me. With us. The stoat looks worried and bemused right now, but he keeps nodding. And there was this smell. This creature, what did it look like? I was expecting him to laugh at me, to question it just as much as I'm doing, but he sounds completely earnest. Couldn't see much. Gray fur, red eyes. Red eyes? Like yours? No, not like mine. Why? I was just curious. He finishes up with my armpits and is about to tuck the sheets even lower, but I grab him by the wrist to stop him in his tracks. I'll take care of that. You should probably get cleaning yourself. He withdraws. Oh, I finished cleaning myself a little while ago. As they say, the early bird catches the worm. I was actually about to get dressed and go over my notes when you began... He makes a face. Well, convulsing. I take the rag from him, leaning back and lifting my legs to do the last bit of cleaning while he gets dressed. Would you like for me to fetch you some fresh water? Or take care of the mess? He eyes the pill besides the bed warily. I'll be alright, thanks. I put the rag down on the nightstand, right next to where the pail had been. But then, I notice a piece of paper underneath the bed. I pull it out. Luckily, it's still clean and dry. It's another one of Cliff's notes. There's several sketches next to the text on it. Most of the folks around town. I recognize Murdoch by the smug grin and the camera hanging around his neck. Underneath this picture is a pretty nice portrait of Cynthia. Mesetta is written next to her in large block letters. The weasel notices me looking at it, wadding towards me with his pants still on his knees. Ah, I was looking for that one. Did you draw these? He nods, pulling his pants up. It must have slipped out of my satchel. I drew Miss Cynthia yesterday as I was waiting for you. He points to the picture of Murdoch. This one's from memory, though. I drew it shortly after I woke up this morning. Just how long has he been awake? For your thesis? Oh, my thesis? In a way, yes. The people and history of this area are exactly why I came here. What people? What history? There's nothing here but dirt and liars. I also just fancy drawing what interests me. People, nature, sometimes even the sky. I frown. Did he draw me? I reach for my shirt and open my mouth, trying to think of how I should phrase the question. This thesis of yours. I stop myself. Thesis. What's it about? Why, I'm glad you asked. He pushes his glasses further up his snout. Have you heard of the Meseta tribe? I've heard Cynthia mention it once or twice. I've asked her about it, but it's a bit of a sore spot. Only a thing or two. Well, I heard... He falls silent mid-sentence, eyes keeping close track of my abs when I pull my shirt on. He clears his throat when I start buttoning up, moving to do the same, taking special care to fix his bow tie. I heard through the grapevine that there's a Meseta tribe settlement not too far from Echo, about two days worth of travel away in fact. I asked Miss Cynthia about it just the other day, but she wasn't very cooperative. As expected. What I intend to do, after I find a guide, of course, is to go there and learn all there is to know. About what? Everything. Their culture, their traditions, what kind of food they eat. He's quaking with excitement. What makes them think that they'll teach them anything? My thesis is going to be about what makes them, them. He gives me a toothy grin, grabbing his satchel from the floor and slinging it over his shoulder. I had a wonderful night, Sam. But, I must be off. I intend to leave for the settlement tomorrow, so there's no time to lose. 
He leans in. We lock eyes for a moment and then presses his muzzle to my cheek. Thank you for a very lovely first experience. I'll have to return for more lessons soon. I've got a lot to teach you. I'm sure you do. I hand him the sheet of paper and he adds it to the collection in his bag. He waves at me, then picks up the pail with the murky water and takes it out the door. The door shuts behind him. I sit there in bed, alone, and watch the sun climb the sky through the slates on the windows. As far as clients go, I certainly could have done worse. It feels like hours have passed when I hear a soft knock on the door. Who is it? It's me. Are you decent? I pull the sheets back up to my waist. Am now. Door creaks as it opens. Cynthia stands in the doorway for a few moments, one brow raised. Then her muzzle splits into the broadest of grins I've seen on her. You're not going to believe this. What did? Your weasel friend paid us four times your usual rate. Four times. I stare at her mouth agape. A thousand things are going through my mind right now. I thought he was only going to pay twice the usual. As did I. As did the madam. What did you do to him? I don't know. Nothing out of the ordinary. Well, when you've got it figured out, do you tell. We share a laugh. I'm still croaking. He mentioned something about talking to you. He does talk a lot, doesn't he? You're changing the subject. Her expression sours. We did talk about the Masetta. What he said about the settlement near Echo. Is that true? She exhales loudly, then nods. I decide to let it rest there. Anything I should watch out for today? You mean besides the madam just about ready to throw herself at you? Could use a break from people throwing themselves at me. There's just a grocery run that needs doing. Your first appointment's the latest out of all of ours, so we volunteered you. Her cheery grin returns. Hope you don't mind. I actually don't. I could use some fresh air. Is it safe to go outside? You should be fine. The sheriff took care of the rides last night, pretty much on his own at that. Wish you were that thorough with me. All right, give me a minute. So long as you're out of bed before they close. The door creaks shut and I'm alone again. I've never been to this general store. Hope the girls haven't had issues finding it before. I stare at the list in my hands while I walk the streets, passing several clients of mine trying their hardest to pretend they haven't noticed me. Couldn't care less. Really. The town square feels eerily quiet after last night. There are no street musicians or newspaper hawkers. Nothing. Can't even hear any birds. Just a bunch of folks with frowns on their faces acting like it's business as usual. I'm one of them. I do my best to follow Cynthia's directions, passing William's office and the barber shop. I could cut through some of the back alleys and save time, but the last thing I want right now is to get jumped. Instead, I decide to stay on the main streets to Town Hall. Beneath an apple tree in front of the steps of the Town Hall, I see an incredibly tall ram. I know who it is. His suit looks like it costs three times what I'd earn in a single lifetime. His eyes are greener than, than the grass itself, gazing down at Echo from behind a custom-fitted monocle with a silver frame. He's flanked by two wolves, one of whom I recognize from the saloon. His face was painted on picket signs last night. There's no doubt about it, this is James Hendricks. He makes eye contact with me and closes the distance between us rather quickly. can't believe I'm gonna do this. Why, uh, hello there, citizen. <laughs> I swallow and pick my words carefully, noticing the wolf staring at me. Hello, sir. I beg your pardon. Didn't mean to startle you. Anything I can help you with? There just might be. He extends his paw. I cautiously reach out to shake it. He has a strong grip. 
My name's James Hendricks. You could say I run this town, but that sounds rather clinical, wouldn't you say? His smile doesn't reach his eyes, but he sounds like his head's so far up his own ass, something else might. Samuel. He lets go of my paw, leaning on his cane once more. Just like Samuel from the Bible, yes? I nod. Lovely. He shoes away the wolves with the hand gesture. Sure is nice to finally put a name to the face. How do you mean? Well, you work at the hip, don't ya? He says it so confidently, so matter-of-factly. I feel my ears heat up, my fists clench so hard the grocery list ends up a crumbled mess. I'm lucky no one's passing by. I think you've got the wrong person. Right, how foolish of me. I can tell by the tone on his voice and the glint in his eyes that we both know I'm lying through my teeth. I'm reminded again by how empty the streets feel right now. The desert wind picks up and makes a few of the wooden shutters rattle. James and I both have to cover our eyes defensively. It passes just as quickly as it picks up. He strains out his jacket and tips his muzzle at me. If you'll excuse me, appointments to keep, businesses to take care of. I nod before walking off and turning round a corner. I catch him looking at me as I do. Turns out crumbling the paper made Cynthia's directions illegible, which means I have to ask around. Who'd have thought a general store would be this hard to find? I end up in front of a large building. Crates and boxes are stacked out in front, but that's not the thing that stands out the most. No, what stands out to me is the red fox standing in front of the door, leaning on one of the numerous boxes, camera clutched in his paws. I feel my stomach lurching again. Well, if it isn't Sam. He walks towards me, camera swinging to and fro across his chest. What brings you here? Running errands. You? I work here. He points a thumb at the store behind him. I thought your job was taking pictures. He grins. And developing the pictures, and sometimes delivering to and when it saves us money on post. But that's just when we have enough hands to manage the store and keep it clean. Then sometimes we need another man behind the register. And then there's the keys. That's a lot. What can I say? I'm a man of many talents. Got back from the sheriff's office not too long ago. And? He lets out an amused chuckle. I suppose I could tell you, but not for free. It's confidential information, as I'm sure you're aware. I don't have any... Oh, I'm not looking for money. Unless you thought about my proposition. I shake my head. The fox tisks. That's what I thought. No, I want details. Murdoch sits on a crate next to me, glancing around to see if anyone's near, before leaning in and whispering. How was your time with Mr. Tibbetts? I can't talk freely about my clients like that. I'm not asking you to talk freely. It's a trade. My information for yours. Why do you care? Does it matter? It does. Very well. To be quite frank, I left last night feeling envious. Funny thing is, between the two of you, I wasn't even sure who I was more envious of. So I didn't imagine him sneaking looks at Cliff last night. And now, I'm just curious. He cuffs his chin to his paw. I mull it over. I'm usually careful with this kind of information, but... I really want to find out what's going on. I sigh, rubbing my temples. It was better than I expected. He ended up paying me four times the usual. Murdoch whistles. Not too shabby. Was he good? I grunt and nod. He laughs. Good to know. Time to hold my end of the bargain. Don't tell the sheriff I told you this, but... Talk of the town is that the investigation regarding the dead miner and the riots went into full swing. 
Sheriff said he wouldn't rest until the perpetrator's hanging from a gallows. My blood runs cold. There's even talk of curfews, enough to frighten any man. Panic wells up within me. He keeps talking, but I lose track, mind racing to hundreds of conclusions in only a few seconds. I have to go. I need to go. My voice wavers. B about time I head back. You sure you aren't, uh, forgetting something? I just nod my head and turn on my heels, leaving the store behind empty-handed. Sam? My brisk walking pace becomes a sprint as soon as he's out of sight. I feel the eyes of every person in town just drilling into me. By the time I pass the sheriff's office, I'm out of breath. But I can't stop running. After a while, the hip looms in the distance. I never thought I'd long for the smell of liquor and unwashed miners this much. Cynthia's standing in the doorway. She waves me over, looking awful confused. Then again, anyone might, seeing me out of breath in the middle of the day. You took a while, Sam. Did you get everything we asked for? Shit. She notices my empty paws as soon as I do. The, the store owner was out. Somebody's always there. That doesn't make any sense. She buries her face in her palms. I don't know what the hell you were doing, but your client's here. Just what I need right now. This early? At least someone's keeping promises around here. She looks at me once more and narrows her eyes. Where is he? Didn't see him myself. The madam took care of it, brought him straight to your room. That's unusual. Go on, get up there. Hey, I'm, I'm sorry, all right? We'll talk about it later. She steps aside and I enter the hip. The panic is slowly leaving my system, though that awful feeling of guilt remains. But I don't have any time to waste feeling sorry for myself. It's time to get to work. I take a deep breath. I can do this. I open the door, a tiny crack, looking for any sign of my client. There's a neatly folded set of clothes sitting on the edge of the bed, but I don't know who they belong to when it's so dark in my room. I open it wider. My breath catches in my throat. Hello there, Samuel. Mr. Hendricks. Come now, there's no need to be so formal, especially not in these circumstances. It's a surprise, sir, that's all. First, that's enough sirs and misters. Second, is this that surprising to you? I always thought myself flamboyant. And surely, it couldn't be so odd for a busy man to have such clandestine fun. I just thought you were a married man and all. No, make no mistake, I love my wife, Samuel. But a woman's touch is not always enough. And I'm told that you're one of the best. Not just in this town, but perhaps the country. There's no chance that I could avoid a dish such as yourself. Come here. I do, and I can see him get hard when I get closer. You know, if you're really good as they say, I might have to keep you. If you can afford me. I grope his balls, which overflow in my paws. The pulse on his dick is steady and slow. He holds on to my waist, fumbling with the buttons on my suspenders until they snap off and the drawers slide down. Then he pulls down my undergarments, exposing me. Folks say your wallet is big. Just after my wallet, are you? He thrusts between my thighs, leaving a stain on me there. There's nothing wrong with loving the fine things in life, boy. Strip. Quickly. He stares at me as I remove each button. My shirt slides off. I step out of my pants. The intensity of his attention and the smell of his erection has me hard to, and I feel myself begin to leak as much as him. I'm surprised at how much I'm enjoying this, because I'm certain that I'm absolutely afraid. He paws at me. I grunt. The sticky sounds are loud. My hands are all over him, too. He's warm and tough, and my muscles contract against his. I'm good at this because I love this. 
and as I sink into my own bed, on top of him, lengths crossing, he bares his neck to me. Without thinking, I swoop down to bite, because he feels like he's mine now. Until he catches my own neck with his hand, and smiles. No marks for now. At least, not on the outside. Put your prick in. He wraps his hooves around me. I want to remember this. I lift his legs, staring at my own erection, letting dribbles of spit cover me. When my tip rubs against his opening, his wispy ears splay back and he exhales deeply through his nostrils. That's it. There's a soft please at first, but quickly turn to growls. I've leaked enough that it's easy to slide in. His insides are like velvet. It's easy to find his spot. His growls turn to happy rumbles, then to desperate rasps. He grips me tight when he starts to spasm, setting me off too. I yell, burying my head in his chest while some of his stray spurts hit the bottom of my chin. Marvelous. I needed that. Badly. I slip out and off of him, and he's already rolling out the bed. James pants, bending over, scrambling for something in his pocket. I watch. The ram tuts at himself and then slips his undergarments on hastily before throwing on his shirt, buttoning up. I took the liberty of getting Madame Dora your payment before you arrived. you have certainly be seeing me again. But your discretion is mandatory. Nobody knows anything about my clients aside from the necessary parties. James looks at me incredulously. And you will not tell Nikolai either. My claws extend involuntarily, nearly ripping holes in the sheets. Nobody should know about Nikolai. He would never give that sort of thing away. So how? So who? He's a good worker. He doesn't get on my nerves. And for his sake, you'll keep it that way. I have to keep the trains moving, after all. Until next time, Sam. The ram hobbles to the door, turning around to look at me before he slips into the doorway. I promise that there will be a next time. Because I could tell that you loved it as much as I did. I lie in my damp bed, unable to move for a while. It's too much for me to think about what just happened. I rise from the bed, even if it's just to get away from his scent sticking to the sheets. Mine's not much better at the moment, but it's more than just a day's sweat clinging to me. I feel dirty, more so than usual. I wash myself, pluck out my fur in front of the dresser mirror, and even straighten out some of it with a brush, but it doesn't help. None of it does. Eventually, light from the golden hour leaks through the slates of my windows. Looks more like a miserable shade of orange than gold, if you ask me. Won't be long until more clients start coming in. Leave me alone. I mutter it under my breath, brush still clenched in my paw. Cynthia. It's me. I can smell Ethel's perfume before I even see her in the doorway. She once told me it was rose-scented. Cynthia likes to compare it to mothballs. The salamander slinks into my room like she owns it, paying my state of undress barely any mind. It smells like a locker in here. It was smelling much better before you walked in. She snorts, then turns to take a drag of her cigarette. No customers tonight? She exhales, puffing out a thick cloud of smoke that makes me crinkle my nose. None that matter. Not even Huxley? Didn't show. I tilt my head, as pathetic as a fucker is, he usually never misses an appointment with Ethel. I'm getting old, Sam. Pretty soon they're gonna replace me with someone younger and prettier. That ain't gonna be hard to find. She laughs so hard she erupts up coughing. So what brings you to my neck of the woods? Ethel shakes her head, taking another drag as her eyes run up and down my body. Work. There's some weasel talking about something to Madame Dora. Didn't hear what it was but she told me to come get you real quick. 
Cliff again? Short fella who talks a lot. That's the one. Guess my break's over before it even begun. You look like shit, by the way. Have you been eating well? Some scraps here and there. I shove the ashtray of my dresser in her general direction. She puts out her cigarette, smoke leaving her nostrils one last time. Maybe get something besides cock in your mouth for a change. Can't afford to have you going all skinny on us. I look in the mirror. She ain't too far from the truth. I'm not exactly skin and bones, but my fur's starting to lose its luster. Yeah, yeah. Just leave and let me get dressed. You got five minutes. I only need two. You and most of my clients. Once she's left, I reach for my clothes, still strewn on the floor from when Hendrix was here. Good thing his scent ain't on them. I wonder what the weasel's on about now. There aren't too many girls in the powder room when I get there, and the ones that are are putting the last touches on their garments for the night. Madame Dora standing right there in the middle of it all, and of course, Cliff's right next to her, his back turned towards me. And the payment? Up front, of course. Money is of no issue in the slightest. Good, good. Oh, there he is now. The doe tips her muzzle towards me, and Cliff turns to follow her example. I catch his eyes almost immediately. His nose twitches, and he pads on over to me, rubbing his paws together. Samuel, so good to see you. Back for your next lesson so soon, Professor. Again, I am a student. Right. I'm afraid I'm here for business rather than pleasure tonight. Your pleasure is my business. I can hear one of the girls laughing in the corner. Behind Cliff, Madame Dora rolls her eyes. Cliff doesn't notice, tugging at his collar, ears twitching wildly. Yes, um, well... He clears his throat. It's about... about my expedition. It took a while. But I found a guide, Samuel. So you came here to celebrate? Not quite. I am actually wanted to ask if you would do me the honor of joining my expedition party. It's going to be a long journey, and I could do with a strong man in tow. I'd get to leave, Echo. I work my jaw trying to keep cool. What would you have me do? Show you a good time on the road? No, 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 no! Not like that! I hear a clicking sound as he fingers brush over the satchel buttons again. I heard the wilderness around Echo is dangerous, and... and... I think I would feel a lot safer traveling with someone I can trust. Someone like you, Sam. I hear my teeth grind as I grit them. Seems like everyone's salesman trying to peddle me trust. Buying it again would just be plain stupid. But then, I think back at what Murdoch said this afternoon. Would it be long until William finds out what happened to Jack? And if he does, I'm sure to hang. I'd much rather take my chances on the road. Might get bit, or get heat stroke, but it's better than waiting to die here. All I need to do is slip out while the weasel's sleeping. Could be halfway to the other side of the country by the time folks find out what happened. I'm in. Madame Dora's eyes find me. She's putting on a face like she's sucking on something sour. When Cliff looks at her, the gentle smile she's known for immediately returns. Very well. If you'll excuse me, sir, I'll take Sam here aside to go over the details. Please enjoy a drink at the saloon or the company of one of the girls while you wait. Oh, that won't be necessary, ma'am. I don't think he'll ever want to drink here again after what happened yesterday. I'll wait here if that's all right with you. Dora nods, gesturing for me to follow her. Cliff's eyes linger on me as we leave the room. Once we're out of earshot, she turns back to me. Her brow is furrowed. Sam, are you entirely sure about taking this fool's proposition? Am I? This 
excitable upstart flounces into town, asks to borrow you for heavens knows how long, and has enough coin to pay up front? Do you reckon something's off? She gives me a look. Of course there's something's off. Money's money, Sam. But you can never just trust a man like that on his word. I should know all too well. I bear my claws. I've got these if he tries anything. Her brow raises. A gun would do better, Sam. Just know that anybody can learn to use a weapon. But persuasion can be just as potent. You can't blame me for doubting your survival instincts after earning that nasty wound on the back of your head. I can handle myself. I've gotten this far. She looks at me, then shakes her head. You have come this far because of my help. Do not squander it carelessly. I appreciate your concern. I am a famous warrior. She gently takes my arm and smiles. I'm gonna miss her when I'm gone. We walk back to Cliff. I almost have trouble keeping up with her brisk pace. He's hunched over one of the dressers, scribbling away on a notepad. One of the girls, an opossum, drapes herself over one of his shoulders, idly rubbing his back. He doesn't seem bothered, but pays her no attention. When she catches sight of us, she returns to her own station, wearing a toothy smile as she passes me. Oh, good! You're back! Cliff turns to us, notepad in hand. I can make out what looks like a horse wearing a cap. Looks like he's been working on it for some time already. Have you decided to accept my proposal? Madame Dora nods. I want him back in one piece. I assure you no harm will come to him. We have an experienced guide and supplies to last us for weeks if need be. I'm more worried about harm coming to him. To be honest, he looks like he'd snap about as easily as a pencil he's holding. Cliff produces a tiny red book from his pocket. He has some sort of insignia on it, golden lines that resemble the head of a weasel. He hastily scribbles something down before ripping it out and handing it to the madam. I look at it from the corner of my eye. It's a check, all right. I ain't even seen that many zeros on one of them, though. Where did this fella get his money from? Madam Dora seems to be thinking the same, lips pursed, but pockets it regardless. She looks at me from the corner of her eye. Samuel, go get your things. I nod, bowing my head to the weasel before excusing myself. Cliff calls after me as I leave the room. I'll be waiting for you outside. Having almost nothing to my name means I don't have much to pack. Even with a change of clothes, my brush, and some basic necessities, there's still plenty of room left in my bag. Hopefully enough for the supplies I'll need to get across the country. Is it really true, Sam? You're leaving? I didn't hear Cynthia enter my room. I must have left the door open. Hard for me to meet her gaze. Part of me still feels an awful mess about what happened this morning. Part of me is wondering if she's going to ask about Hendrix. Hopefully not. Just for a while. That's a relief. I can't imagine this place without you. Listen, Cynthia, I'm sorry about what happened with the groceries. That's why you're leaving? Trying to escape my wrath? She chuckles. Sam, it's okay. Really, we're just all a bit on edge at the moment, is all. Tell me about it. Ethel said Huxley didn't show up tonight. Wouldn't surprise me if he was staying overnight at Williams again. That man's always causing trouble. Mr. Tibbetts told me what he did to him. Nobody deserves to get treated like that. They roughed him up bad. I was there. It's one thing after another in this town. Ever thought about leaving? Going back to... She cuts me off. No, I have not. This is my home, Sam. The light in the room dims. I peek at the lamp, noticing its faint light flickering. 
It's about to run out of oil. Is that where he's taking you, then? To the settlement? I nod. She rubs her temples, exhaling through her nostrils. He really has a mind set on this, doesn't he? Seems like he has. So, when will I see you again? Hard to say. I swallow. Chances are I'll never see her again after tonight. She steps closer, spreading her arms. I reciprocate, pulling her into one of the tightest hugs I've ever shared since we met. She buries her muzzle in my chest. I swear I can hear her sniffling very quietly, though it's getting too dark to see her face clearly. For a few moments, there's no one in the world but us. I want to tell her to come with me, to go anywhere but here, but I can't. I'm gonna miss you. I'll be back before you know it. It physically hurts to say. I'm glad she can't see my face right now. You better. We stay like that for a long while. Being outside ain't so bad when the sun ain't being down on you every waking moment. It's not as noisy as last night either. Hell, it's almost like the riot never happened. As we walk the empty streets, Cliff's pacing several steps ahead of me. Good thing he's wearing flashy clothes, or I'd never be able to see him in the dark. We should be arriving momentarily. Where do you live? I'm renting the apartment above the barbershop. It serves me quite well, considering the price. And with it being so close to the sheriff's office, there's nothing to be afraid of. I've passed that building a lot of, on errands, but I've never knew that there was an apartment above it. You're actually one of my very first visitors. Am I now? I'm not really surprised. The fox fellow from yesterday delivered some supplies I requested for the expedition, but he didn't stay long. It would seem he works at the general store. Very friendly chap, not at all what I expected based on my first impressions. Murdoch. I wince, hoping the fox didn't tell him about my behavior earlier. Maybe I should change the subject. What about the guide? Our guide is a strapping stallion by the name of Jedediah Coles. A man of very few words, but he was the only one willing to join me. We're coming on the sheriff's office now. The lights inside are still on, shining down on two men talking in the front. William and Reed. Instinctively, I grab Cliff by the wrist, pulling him into the little alleyway next to William's office. What are you- He squeaks, and I pray to the Lord that the two men don't hear it. I put a finger to my muzzle. Surprisingly, he doesn't protest. Craning my head around the corner, I perch my ears and listen. When was the last time you saw him? We were playing cards last night. Same thing we do every week. He got a little drunk. You know how it goes. But he was well enough to walk home last time I saw him. Behind me, Cliff audibly gasps. It scares the shit out of me, and I have to try my hardest not to make a sound. That's him! That's one of the men who assaulted me! One of them. Keep it down. And then he didn't show up to work today. Did he have any enemies? Wasn't smart enough to make any. If you ask me, it's probably the fag weasel who done it. It wouldn't happen to be the same weasel you boys beat to a pulp yesterday now, would it? The wolf's smug expression immediately drops. He tried to... You're lucky I've got better things to take care of, Reed. If I catch wind of you causing trouble again, we're going to be looking at more than just a fine. Off with you. Tail tucked between his legs, the wolf scampers off into the night, slurring under his breath. William watches him go, arms folded, then leans against the building. Same goes for you two. I grit my teeth. I should have known. William can smell me from a mile away. I gingerly step out of the alley, cliff in tow. William looks at me from the corner of his eye, bemused. Part of me fears Murdoch told him what happened. I dread what he's about to say. Visiting folks at home now... I breathe a sigh of relief. 
I'm about to answer, but William shakes his head. I don't care. Not a smart idea to be out this late with all that's happened. Why? We have a missing rat. Got taken in the dead of night, right after the riots. Gone without a trace. Your friend over there might know him. I guess Huxley really is gone. Good riddance if you ask me. Cliff steps in next to me. William regards him coolly. Normally, I'd agree, but the situation we're in has been anything but normal. If one dead mind is enough to spark a riot, another might get the whole town burned down. Folks ain't gonna be happy. It takes me a while to decide to say what I'm going to say next. Think it's the same fellow that did the first one? Can't be sure. If it is, it won't be long before he slips up. Best thing for you and your friend to do now is to stay inside and lock the door. We've no time to stay indoors. We're leaving Echo tomorrow. William grunts. Any particular reason? Academic purposes. Academic purposes, he says. Was there to study tumbleweeds? Actually, if there's a worse place to be in, in this town, it'd be outside. I can take care of criminals and thugs, but no one can save you from rattlesnakes and black widows. I shiver at the thought. Maybe go to Town Hall instead, kid. Plenty of books there. Cliff's brow furrows. His bottom lip is quivering. I am not a child! I've only been in this town for a fortnight, and I've already been beaten, spat on, insulted, and generally treated like refuse. If you actually did your job instead of fraternizing with every man who nearly killed me yesterday, perhaps it would be better to stay here. As it stands right now, though, I'd be better off. Oh, pardon me, sir. Let me just fetch the nice plates and the silver cutlery. I'm sorry that this ain't like whatever the fuck you came from, weasel. There's some venom in his last word. Clearly it isn't, or do you have learned some manners by now, brute? The last thing I need right now is a lecture about manners from a faggot like you. I'm used to the language like that from William, but Cliff recoils, clutching his satchel tightly. William's eyes find mine, peering right at me. They widen slightly before closing. Sam, get this weasel out of my face. No need, we're already leaving. We cross the street. I give William one last look, but he doesn't acknowledge me. Cliff leads me up the rickety stairs that lead to the second floor of the barber shop. I feel like the plants could give away and fall at any moment. I can't believe he actually said such a thing. Is there no decency left in this town? When we reach the top, he digs through his pockets for a good few moments, looking for the keys. He puts the key in the lock and tries turning it. It doesn't budge at first, taking some wiggling back and forth. Blast it! Finally, the lock clicks. The door opens inward, causing Cliff to stumble forward. I barely manage to catch him by the scruff of his neck, pulling him back onto his feet. Ah! Uh, thank you, Samuel. Anyway, this is my temporary home. He gestures to the doorway, and I walk in. Beyond lies a dark living room, almost as bare bones as my room at the hip. He walks briskly ahead of me, lighting a lamp that allows me to see things more clearly. For a man so fussy with appearances, he's barely a personal touch in the walls or furniture. The sitting area is just a sofa and a low table with no dining table to speak of. On the table next to a stack of books and a vase of yellow flowers is a bag of what looks like candy of some sort. Taffies, maybe. I recognize the smell. The one expensive thing in this room is a phonograph standing on a small table in the corner, next to the door perhaps leading to the bedroom. Please, make yourself at home. Would you like some tea? I've only ever had sweet tea before. Uh, sure. He claps his hands together, grinning up at me. Splendid. Please have a seat. He scurries off into the kitchen, leaving me alone in the room. I take a seat on the sofa. 
Greek's a fox, and I'm starting to think Murdoch did more than just visit. I look at the books on the table to distract myself. They've all got titles longer than any book I've ever seen before. I grab the one on top. It's thick, written in a language I don't know how to read. Probably Batavian, but it has pictures. Most of them show wolves and loincloths. One shows a cat serving a wolf grapes. That sounds very familiar. Must be one of his school books. I slip one of the taffies into my mouth. It's sweet, almost sickeningly so, yet I can't help but eat another one right after. Maybe Ethel was right about me, my eating habits. The rattling of pots and pans rouses me, and before long I hear a strange, downright hellish whistling sound. I freeze, slowly chewing and swallowing the taffy in my mouth. Bits of it stick to my teeth. Is everything alright? I hear the sound of some water hitting the ground, then a long, high-pitched squeak. Silence follows. I get up and throw the book on the table, half running to the kitchen. Cliff, are you? Cliff is standing with a tea kettle in hand, shaking his free hand wildly. Oh, Samuel, so sorry to have frightened you. I just spilled some of the tea water on myself. Need any help? It happens all the time. No need to worry. I watch as he tries again, filling two cups standing on an ornate tray with steaming hot water. He adds a little bag to each cup. Do you want sugar in yours? I don't know. Is it good with that kind of tea? It all depends on the personal taste. That said, I usually drink mine with sugar. I'll take some too then. After pouring some sugar into both cups, he takes a tray and hands it to me. Could you bring it to the living room for me? I'll clean up the mess here. Don't drink it right away, alright? It needs to sit for a bit to bring out the flavor. That, and you might burn your tongue if you drink it right now. Tray in hand, I return to the sofa and the little table, sneaking another taffy as I do. Putting it down and sitting on the couch, I watch the sugar dissolve and the water turn a deeper color. Smells like apples. Cliff walks out of the kitchen soon enough, heading straight for the phonograph. He fiddles with it some, then puts the needle on the record. A foreign piece starts to play, and the weasel steps to the melody, hopping this way to the sofa to sit right down next to me. I can feel the tremors of the shakes through the couch fabric. He seems like he's a little shaky from what happened outside. I find that listening to music is the best way to unwind after a loathsome and turbulent day. He reaches for the nearest cup of tea and reclines, blowing on it some to cool it down. He gives it a long whiff. I think it's about right. I grab mine too. It's almost too hot to handle. Up close, the scent is even more pronounced. It's not much like the usual drinks at the saloon. Next to me, the weasel takes a careful sip. I catch him wince from the heat, but he still takes another sip. I follow his example. Might be due to the sickly sweet taffies I ate earlier, but the sour bitterness hits the spot. It's a bit too hot, maybe, but I could get used to this. We'll be leaving for the town square shortly before the sunrise to meet with the rest of the expedition party. Why so early? Leaving early means we can cover the longest distance before it gets too warm. We'll make an afternoon stop at the sightseeing point on Echo Canyon. There are many local myths and stories surrounding that canyon. I'm excited to see what it has in store for us. Even I've heard the rumors. Some folks say that they can hear things there. It goes from long ago. Once we make it to the other side, we'll make camp. After that, it should take us another day, if the weather allows. He takes another long sip, closing his eyes and breathing out a blissful sigh. What do you need me to do? He's paying. Might as well see if I can teach him some more. I brush a paw against his leg. He recoils, ears turning red. I assure you, my reasons for hiring you weren't only sexual in nature. He says that, but the paw holding the little cup is trembling. Part of it simply has to do with practicality. Some tasks will require strength I do not possess myself. Though there is... 
He clears his throat, drinking some tea. I raise a brow at him. There is... I wouldn't call it a connection, so to speak. Not yet. But I do see you as a kindred spirit. You're one of a few people in this town who have treated me with a modicum of respect. I appreciate that. Not even the sheriff could help in the end. He finishes his cup. I do the same with mine. All the sugar ain't good for me. We exchange glances as the music swells. He breathes out and gets up from the sofa, taking my paw that is still resting on his leg. Stand up, please. I'd like to show you something. I get back up to my feet. The weasel slides an arm around my waist, putting an arm on my back. It's warm. Dancing? Have you ever danced before? Only for clients who request it, but it, he doesn't need to know that. A few times. Wonderful. He snakes up against me. I step back and he closes the gap again. Let's try to move as a one. When I pull, you push. He steps back. This time I step forward, managing to somewhat match the rhythm of the music. His chest presses against my body. His warm paw squeezes mine tightly. Now, watch my footwork. We move back and forth across the room. It becomes a game of sorts as I try to imitate what Cliff does, and my pace adjusts to his. I help him twirl me around, narrowly avoiding swatting him with my tail yet again. You're a natural, Sam. Ain't it your job to teach people new things? Again, no! I smirk at him. He presses into me, paw sticking. We're both starting to break a sweat. The weasel's mouth opens slightly, slender tongue poking out as he pants softly. I follow suit, struggling to keep up as he steps get more complicated. The weasel, not so much. His speed doesn't surprise me, considering what he is. I've always heard that it's in a weasel's blood to be cowardly. It's in his nature to be built to run. I can't help but wish I was built to slip away too. The song winds down to a close and the record stops. We collapse on the sofa together. I enjoyed that. Where'd you learn to step like that? My parents insisted on lessons when I was young. I stopped going after my mother passed away. But dancing is something you never really forget how to do. Ha. If you don't mind, I think I shall get some rest. It's been a long day, and tomorrow will be longer still. Where do I sleep? You can take the bed. I'll sleep here. I'd offer to sleep together, but the bed is far too small for two people. I don't mind sleeping here, actually. It's your bed. Oh no, I, I insist. He points to the door next to the phonograph. The bedroom is behind the door. The washroom is adjacent to it, should you want to clean up. Thanks. I'll keep that in mind. As I get up, the weasel grabs my wrist tightly, muzzle curling upward in a shy smile. Good night, Samuel. Good night, Professor. He doesn't correct me this time. Dawn is about to break by the time we make our way to the town square. The town's still asleep. The early chirps of birds sound above us, but besides that, there's no sound but our footsteps. The air is still cool, and I kick myself wishing that I brought something thicker than this shirt. Cliff is walking next to me, bag of taffies in hand. Every now and then, he offers me one. We had a pretty big breakfast, so I refuse. I can see the apple tree in front of the town hall. Shivers run up my spine, memories of the ram from yesterday coming back to me. We're getting close. With any luck, they'll already be there. You wouldn't be happy to looking for us, would you? That goddamn fox. Of course he just had to be here. He's gonna make my escape a lot more difficult. Murdoch steps out from behind the apple tree. He's followed by a horse with blonde mane and a cap. This is the fellow Cliff was sketching last night. Must be our guide. Heavens, you startled me. Terribly sorry, Mr. Tibbets. His muzzle splits into a toothy grin. Got the extra supplies you asked for. Oh, thank you. And Cliff is fine. Anyway, 
Samuel. He gestures towards a horse, who seems to be looking straight through me. And this is Mr. Coles. Mr. Coles, this is the man I told you about. The stallion takes a moment to respond. Finally, he extends a paw. Call me Jedediah. Sam. We shake paws. His are rough to the touch. And you know Murdoch? I'm afraid I do. Quite a daring group of rogues we've assembled. You're coming too? Of course he is. Every expedition needs to be documented. And what better way to document than with a camera? Murdoch shakes the camera hanging from his neck. Cliff here came to our store to buy supplies. We ended up talking while I was helping with deliveries. I showed him some of my work, and he offered to hire me. Probably wasn't the only thing he showed him. Why, do you have any objections to him coming along, Sam? I don't, because I like Murdoch. Gotta play nice for now. I can't afford them getting suspicious. Of course not. Just didn't figure you for the adventuring type. Oh, you're absolutely right. But my family business is getting paid quite handsomely. My parents insisted I go. Besides, I've heard there's all sort of exciting scenery on the road. He's rather obviously looking at Cliff, who doesn't notice. I suppose now that introductions have been dealt with, we can be on our way. Jedediah nods his head with a grunt. He slings his large pack over his shoulders, heading down the main street. Cliff follows, leaving Murdoch on me behind. As I get ready to go with them, the fox walks up to me, hands in his pockets. There's a curious smile tugging at his muzzle. So, Sam... You left quite suddenly yesterday. What's the matter? I have to think of something to say, and fast. Could ask you the same thing. What's going on between you and Cliff? Don't dodge the question. Just trading information, same as you did. Did he tell you? No, but I know what Fox smells like. He shakes his head. We had a chat in his apartment, and one thing led to another. It was a nice change of pace. I'm surprised to how easily I managed to get that out of him. Almost like he wants me to know. You're not denying it? Denying it would be a waste of both of our time. I think it's your turn to answer my question. There's no way I'm getting out of this one. Just, uh, forgot about an appointment I had. Must have been an important fella if you left without buying anything. You could say that again. You look frightened. I was worried I'd said something to upset you. Murdoch, Sam, what's the matter? Cliff comes padding back to us. Oh, Sam and I had some matters to talk about. You can talk on the road if you like. We need to be out of town before the sun rises. Very well. We'll continue this conversation some other time, then. And this is where I leave it. At the start of Clifford, Chapter 2. If I recall correctly, uh, everyone's route starts at chapter 2. So there's going to be Clifford chapter 2, Nikolai chapter 2, Murdoch chapter 2, and William chapter 2. So this was a little show of Clifford right before his story really begins. As you can tell, he's not really a pushover, but you can still probably push him over. And he's smart, but he's not very street smart. And he's adorable. He's... <laughs> He's, um, he's a bisexual disaster, because he's bi. He's like one of the only bi characters in Echo right now. Um, because William is just homophobic, but he's gay. Nikolai is gay, but he's very secretive about it, and Murdoch is gay, and he's open-ish about it. I mean, he has gay friends and stuff like that. But yeah, thank you for watching slash listening, and if you would like to play any of the Echo games yourself, there will be links down in the descriptions. If you would like to support the Echo Project, then there will be a link to their Patreon 
in the itch pages, which are down in the description, and I highly recommend it. You will get access to early builds of all of their projects, and this coming March, you will get early access to Arches before anyone else. And you won't have to wait for me to narrate it, you know, whenever I get to it. And, you know, you can do it yourself. And you'll also get access to certain little things here and there, like um, concept art for the characters from the various stories or the short stories for Echo and certain other little things here and there. And I recommend that you support them. If you like these stories, then just go support them already. But yeah, um, let's see what happens. Let's see if I, hopefully I'm able to record something and post it for Friday before I end up having to do that thing on Thursday. So until then, bye-bye.